one shall leave until I find if the living have been killed by the dead. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Backlot Adventure Movie. My name is Tucker and today I am joined by my mustachioed co-host Tanner Dykstra and we're here to talk about A Haunting in Venice, the third in Kenneth Branagh's Hercule Poirot trilogy. Mm -hmm. And we want to hear your thoughts as well. Of course, this is a community where we discuss movies. So you can leave comments, you can join our Discord, you can subscribe, you can like the videos. It's YouTube. You know what to do, Tanner. You've you've upturned your mustache ever so slightly. We will see if it sticks. But Tanner, we've seen Haunting in Venice following up after seeing uh, Death on the Nile mm -hmm. last year. That being a little bit of a letdown, uh, I would say. And Tanner, <laughs> what do you feel about A Haunting in Venice? Tucker, my overwhelming thought while watching A Haunting in Venice and after the credits rolled were three words three words can encapsulate it sure okay no four words One? no four sorry i, I oh, missed okay. out of my head four words it's a real movie yeah that's four yeah. words yeah uh and especially in comparison to the uh train wreck that you just brought up uh death sure. on the nile yeah. it haunting in venice feels so grounded feels so complete yeah. so holistic uh and mm -hmm. feels much truer to what I feel Kenneth Branagh wants from his Hercule Poirot yeah. series of films. Oh, definitely. And just, like, is quite solid all the way through. Um, great performances, really great setting yeah. and production design and lighting and everything. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll get into the plot, and, you know, I don't know what we want to do for spoilers since this is based on, like, a hundred-year-old book. Uh, mm -hmm. But... Yeah, like, it's just really solid. And I was a little apprehensive going into it because, you know, I, I felt like we were on a bit of a downward slide with this series. Sure. But this is... We were. Yeah. But this is, to me, like, the best of the three, personally. Yeah. I mean, I, I had three words going through my head. You might have had four, but Tanner, I was even okay. simpler. I had three. It was, we're so back. We're so back. Or he's so yeah. back. Because I think the thing that really impressed me with A Haunting in Venice is that for a sort of different turn for this series, being presented more as a darker, more horror-toned movie, mm -hmm. Kenneth Branagh, I don't know if he really has done something like that before. I, I think that I, Frankenstein, I haven't seen that movie. Uh, or no, I'm, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Yes, I'm sure it's quite frightening. Sorry. Yeah, I have no idea. I haven't seen it, so it might be a horror movie. It might not be. Um, but in the last few years, or most of our lifetime, mm -hmm. he's been doing mostly, like, younger skewing stuff. He did Artemis Fowl, he did Thor, mm -hmm. like, th these are just sort of, like, family movies, and of course he's sort of um, returned to something a little more, his speed with the Hickel Poirot series, um, and then, of course, with Belfast, mm -hmm. but A Haunting in Venice, you're right, coming off of Death on the Nile, this is just a complete breath of fresh yeah. air. It, it It is a cinematically interesting film yes. which frankly cannot be said for most of the studio movies that we go to see every week you know we see the nun too and we see big my big fat greek wedding mm -hmm. and, and and just week on week on week and the and the meg too and blue beetle and strays <laughs> and we're like jesus christ man God. Like, there's nothing going on here but then we're sitting in haunting in venice and the camera's being placed in interesting yes. places yes. and the production is super consistent and we're doing creative things with with the lighting and the sound design we're like wow he really cared to make this movie. It's shot on location. Yeah. It feels very consistent. And it does some really interesting things for Hikyo Pro as a character, especially if you've seen the other yeah, movies. Yeah, yeah. Having him sort of doubt his own confidence and having to sort of be coming out of retirement for this job. There are some interesting character work done here. And while I personally wouldn't say it's the best of the three because um, uh, Murder on the York Express, I think, is a little more distinct. Sure. Um, this movie is, is just a nice encapsulation of what Kenneth Branagh can do when he's given the creative freedom to really sink into a true main yeah. movie. I I I want to I want to drill in on that a second because I want I do want to sure. explain my it's a real movie uh claim yes, yes. from the from the beginning of this video. And it's exactly kind of like uh, like like don't worry darling. Exactly, yeah, exactly. You know, like, it's kind of like a go to the It's a go to movie. the theater kind of movie. No, but Tucker, it's exactly what you said, uh, where we're coming off of the slew of August slop that we got. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's not inundated with garbage CGI imagery. Yeah. It's, it feels like it's made by a person who actually cares about, like, crafting mm. a cinematic experience and, like, yeah. making interesting imagery and making interestingly composed shots. It may, it, it's made by a person who feels like they care about it as a movie. 
um, yes, as, as an art piece, really, uh, which is crazy well, to it's say especially, about you know, a Hercule Poirot movie, but it's the yes. case. Yeah, I mean, it's especially the, the case when you compare it against Death on the Nile, yeah. which is a movie that, granted, was heavily produced, re-edited, and reshot during the pandemic, so there are some limitations to be made there, but we've seen plenty of pandemic movies that, that use that to that, its potential, mm-hmm. but uh, Death on the Nile was so stuffed with horrible CGI yeah. background shots and a sense of spectacle being set in Egypt and stuff that really did not lend itself to what the movie was mm-hmm. actually it's, capable yeah. of delivering. Yeah. And I think what Haunting in Venice realizes is that while it is shot on location in Venice and there's some really, like you can feel that they're actually in this place, mm-hmm. it is a very contained movie. It It, it is made on the cheap and, and um, it's a- able to look good because it's keeping itself contained to one location and yes. using a small cast of mostly lesser known actors, it plays into its strengths very well. And I think Kenneth Branagh knew what he was doing to sort of give this franchise a little bit of a shot in the leg. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about the movie specifically. Let, let's get into the let's get into yeah. the specifics here. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You brought up the cast, and I think that's a, a good enough place to start because one of the reasons that I thought this we were, we were maybe going to continue on a downward slide was because sure. this wasn't as star-studded as the previous yes, two installments. True. Made me a little worried. Maybe the studio uh, or Kent Branagh or perhaps Hollywood as a whole was losing confidence in this. But, yeah. I mean, while that maybe may be true... The cast is still fantastic in this. I mean, yeah. uh, the biggest star going into this is probably Michelle Yeoh coming off of an Oscar mm-hmm. win. And while she's, let's just say, not in a lot of the movie, uh, she's mm-hmm. really good in the parts that she is in. She plays, oh, uh, what's her, Joyce something. Uh, I don't know the uh, name, she, yes. She's like the medium, the person who puts on the seance that Hercule Poirot is su- there to supposedly uh, debunk and sort of a, yeah. uh, call out as a phony. Uh, mm-hmm. And she is like when she ha- is doing her seance stuff, she's winging around in her chair and screaming and like uh, conjuring different voices uh, of the spirits and stuff like that. Yeah, she ha- kind of goes. She has a scene where she kind of goes toe to toe with uh, Hercule Poirot and like mm-hmm. sort of calls him out on his BS a little bit on being a bit of a, a coward in his way of like retiring yeah, yeah. and um, why he should why he is refusing to believe in the supernatural. She's quite mm-hmm. good in this, and so is everyone. Yeah, I, I want I want to say. Yeah, it's a, it's a great uh-huh. cast across the board. I think part of the appeal of the last couple of movies was seeing a bunch of people that we've seen in other movies come together to play these sort of more stereotypical roles of that guy's the doctor uh-huh. and that guy's the, I don't know, fucking hunter. And that, He's that the body, the, the the pod, the body nail guard, clipper. Yeah. Know, who, who the yeah, hell knows? Yeah. But uh, this movie, I think, does a good job in bringing together a, a cast of characters that you're not sure how are connected. Mm-hmm. They're all here for this seance but you can't quite tell for i'd say like half of the movie why yeah. most of them are there and i think that it leads to a compellingly paced movie where no character is given a specifically large amount of screen mm-hmm. time it feels very balanced in that regard as uh hercule Poirot and uh his his friend tina fey yes. uh who's playing the author that writes books sort of based lightly on or heavily on uh-huh. hercule Poirot's uh, adventures the two of them are going around and as everyone's locked down because of a murder in this in this um, Venice home, what what was your alibi? What's your backstory? Exactly. What motivations might they have? And the pacing of jumping around from scene to scene in, in these interrogations and in between introducing some uh, some sequences of Herka Pro uh, thinking that he's seeing ghosts mm-hmm. and hearing noises and the stress and cutting away to other people of like what are their plans? What are they doing? I it, I think it leads to a really well paced yeah. movie. This movie just absolutely flew by and when we were at the last act i'm like oh oh, oh great we're, here. we're, we're yeah, already at this we point arrived. um and it, i think it all funnels back down to i just like seeing kenneth branagh as hercule Poirot mm-hmm. puzzle through situations yes. ask questions think through scenarios place together okay if you know this brick is moved just slightly mm-hmm. what does that mean about this guy that's on the other side of the building he's thinking about things on such a external level you know mystery brained uh-huh. guy it, it is always compelling to watch, even when things don't really make sense to the viewer. And I think that this is where the fantasy of these movies kind mm-hmm. of uh, leaves of a little course. bit of a gap for yeah. me. Especially when placed in comparison to the, I don't think controversial to say, but superior mystery gaggle movies uh, in the in Knives Out uh. series. Um, which I think are a little more sensical to follow along with. 
Hercule Poirot likes to puzzle together things with information we were never given and notice things that we might have seen in the background of a shot but were never drawn attention to, so there was never any real way that you could have put things together. Mm -hmm. And so, while I am loving the pacing, I think the reason why this, to me, doesn't stand up against Knives Out and Glass Onion is when you get to the twist at the end and he's revealing things, I'm like, yeah, sure, I guess that's probably what happened. (laughs) I believe you because you're the guy, but I didn't see anything any of that coming. Yeah. Well, here's the thing, Tucker. I think that's... Yeah, I, I always like that in a mystery film, of course. Sure. Um, I mean, that that's what marks a good one, I think, is not uh, when they can just pull stuff out of a hat and say, like, ah, oh, this is what happened, but when they do give you sensible... Uh, like, little cookie... Little, little, little crumb trails uh, to follow through yeah, the film. Sure. Like, for instance, I won't give too much away since we haven't said spoilers thus far, Yeah, but... When there's the line about the bees and stuff like that, that you, that used mm-hmm. to be in the garden, I was like, it's weird that this, like, dialogue exchange is going on for as sure. long as it is. It's yeah. not, like, yeah. super long. It's, like, three or four lines or whatever. It was like, it's weird that we're mm-hmm. drawing attention specifically to this, so this will obviously yeah. have some sort of payoff uh, in the reveal. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, like, even towards the beginning of the film, I... I to be fair, though, I do this for every character, and I love trying to puzzle sure. out a mystery uh, mm-hmm. while, while it's happening, a murder mystery and a mystery film. I don't know about you, um, but, yeah. like, I'm always trying to, like, okay, so if this person did it, then why would they do it? How would they have done it? Da, 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 da. I'm trying to figure it out with my good pal, Hercule Poirot. The yeah. person who did it, you guys go right back. I was like, they might have done it. They might have done it at the beginning yeah. of the film, but I yeah. also did that for every character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so did you, you found the mystery super compelling? What did you think about the pacing? Oh, uh, sure. I, I think the, yeah, the, the pacing of the reveal and uh, the twists and turns of like revealing people's alibis and da 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 uh, and uh, you know, their motivations and certain reveals, yeah. secrets that they were keeping, I thought was very compelling. Some of them, you know, as you have in mysteries are sort of red herrings, false leads, uh, and some of yeah, them of do tie into the ending. Um, but yeah, I thought this was very well paced. And I didn't feel. Um, I, I think we talked about the the mystery reveal at the end when we walked out. That uh, I enjoyed it, but I get that like it's not like an, oh my gosh, I can't believe it moment. It can't really top the murder on the Orient Express flipping the mystery, the murder mystery on its head that everyone did it. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's still quite good. I think it's it's not a bad yeah. reveal. I don't. Oh, no. Yeah. And, and, and I certainly wouldn't yeah, say yeah. that. I just think for me, it was like, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, sure. I was I was more enjoying the ride Absolutely. rather than the destination. Yeah, sure. um, but I think that another thing that lends this movie to feeling very distinct, especially in this time when we aren't getting a ton of, of murder mystery movies, but the Hercule Poirot series and the Benoit Blanc series are consistent mm-hmm. uh, over the last few years. What sets this movie apart is that it's drawing from hard tone and aesthetics. Mm-hmm. And the setting and the supernatural themes and the tone and framing of having occasional jump scares and dark hallways and you know someone running by and you think you saw someone in the background of the Mm -hmm. shadow that i think gives us a really distinct flavor a horror mystery flavor that frankly we don't ever get i mean honestly i can't really place a horror murder mystery in in my in my mind um and that's really really cool and it shows that there's still gas left in the tank for this genre and for what Kenneth Branagh can do with the uh, Hercule Poirot series because you just throw him into like a slightly different genre and bam, it feels exactly. very, very special. Uh, yeah, I, I talk, you brought up the, the horror themes and I thought it, that the setting and sort of the atmosphere of the film did yeah. uh, assist with where Branagh wanted to take Hercule Poirot's character uh, in this. Yes, let's talk about that. Um, because... If you remember, and I know this is, a de- this is going to be a thing, if you remember from Death on the Nile, which is a sentence no one should be saying, um, no. it does, uh, that story, that film um, sort of, I felt derailed itself with a lot of Poirot backstory and like flashbacks. Um, and yeah. t- well, de- the only Murder in the Lord Express could be derailed. That would have to be more like, I don't know, de- de- river- de- derivered. Derivered, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, beached, you know, a run, run sure. around. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, it, it gave us his World War One backstory? Is that Yeah, timeline? that sounds right. right okay. Um, and in this, it sort of Maybe. plays upon that. His, his PTSD and more broadly, um, this sort of theme and sort of uh, 
character flaw, I guess you would say, that he has given up mystery solving because, you know, he yeah. feels that death follows him everywhere he goes. He's very depressed at the state of the world. Um, he mm -hmm. refuses to believe in the supernatural or the spiritual because, like, yeah. because of the horrors that he's seen and the, the horrible mm -hmm. acts that humans are uh, able to commit to each other. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's why he's become so jaded by the world. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that this is... Uh, the, the 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 film really plays with that especially with like the whole death follows him everywhere he goes mm -hmm. as they're in a uh palazzo that is supposedly haunted by the ghosts of children who died in the plague um yeah and i think that it sort of brings about his character to like be less jaded to bring him back around to spoilers i guess he solves mysteries again at the end of this yeah yeah uh he's mm -hmm. back in his old poirot uh uh sort of shoes doing his thing mm -hmm. um i think it brings it about in a solid way um but not in like a this is the best written character i've ever seen i can't believe no, how well of course. i can't believe how well it, it's done it's just like yeah. a very solid character arc, i think yeah well i think it's just strong characterization yeah. for this kind of murder murder mystery solving guy that he is having self-doubt and i think that the movie actually sets us up in a very interesting place at the beginning where hector Poro is trying to keep himself as distanced from other people as possible and he doesn't really leave his house too much and he's kind of just content like doing the crosswords and eating some crimpets or whatever yeah. the hell <laughs> uh and but he's also really famous yes. at the beginning of this. And, of course, that was mostly implied in the other movies. As other people like, oh, you're Hector Poirot. We, we've heard your name before. But seeing lines of people lining up to like, hey, I've, I've had an issue. Someone I know died. I want you to help me with this. And him just like breezing past them and trying to go about his mm -hmm. day and, and distancing himself from this. I feel like you feel this weight of his fame and his skill sort of haunting him and his past haunting him. And as he stumbles into this scenario, as Tina Fey sort of drags him out of his mm -hmm. shell, you can see him across the course of the movie come to grips with the fact that he might be afraid of the fact that he's not quite comfortable with the life that he leads or the position he has as a famous person or that he feels that ha uh, death has been haunting mm -hmm. him or following him, but that he does enjoy doing this. And he is really goddamn good yeah. at it. And so when you we see him sort of stumbling over his lines or like wondering if he should ask a question or should go through with mm -hmm. something, I think that gives a really distinct edge sure. to yeah, this absolutely. guy that has we've seen solve some other murders, but has really only been that until the World War One backstory mm -hmm. or the war backstory that gave him a little bit of context, but I didn't give a shit really. <laughs> um, we also saw we also saw like the origin of his mustache. You remember oh, that in the yeah. last one? Yeah, it was like he had a friend who died who had a similar mustache, and that's why he keeps that facial. Mm. It was weird. Um, but I think this is a more thoughtful yes, characterization uh, for this character. He feels more like a guy. He has this self-doubt. He has these character flaws that really bring him some character. And I think that ends up, for me, car carrying the movie where the rest of the supporting cast are doing a great uh -huh. job in their acting. Their writing is totally fine, but they're not like, I'm not like Jones well, to said, learn Tucker, a lot about They are them. like caricatures as as the side yes, characters yes. in mystery novels and agatha christie like novels or agatha christie novels themselves often Ooh. are uh they're just like they they kind of have uh an element to the character that is the thing like there's the 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 overbearing mother the kind of like sleazy fiance mm -hmm. um the uh perhaps the the crazed doctor uh the yeah. weird smart kid stuff like that mm -hmm. uh and they and they, like i said all the actors who embody those roles do them very well. I wanted to call out yeah. specifically uh, two, the one, the last two I just named, Jamie Dornan and Jude Hill, oh, yeah. uh, previous yeah. collaborators of Kenneth Branagh in Belfast, mm -hmm. uh, are in this, and both do very good work, I think. Uh, yeah. I was particularly surprised by a certain monologue that um, Jamie Dornan gives about like why mm -hmm. he's sort of in this deep-set psychosis, and he is kind of like mumbling to himself the whole movie and stuff like that. Um, his monologue is very, very good. I thought I was really yep. drawn in by like him talking about the the weight that it, that was on his soul about the person, the patient that he lost, and how mm. that sort yeah. of parallels uh, Poirot's thing about being followed by sure. death and haunted That's by uh, all the murders that he's had to solve and all the murders he's experienced. Um, yeah, and and that actually kind of externalization ties together his characterization and the actual like tone and plot of the mm -hmm. movie in a really tight way. Is that Everyone in this movie feels like they are haunted by something yeah. they previously did. Because this is about a, a death. Uh, there's a murder, but then there's a previous death yes. that is kind of the more kind of the more important one, to yeah. be honest, like the core yeah. plot, uh, about a girl dying. And is she 
is she haunting? Is there a supernatural element uh-huh. that, of course, is coming uh, uh, by uh, Michelle Yeoh, like, doing a seance and all that? But the guilt of actions, mm-hmm. what was their involvement in the death of this girl previously a couple years ago, and how has that impacted them since that has happened? That is the plot of the murder mystery part mm-hmm. of the movie, but it's also, you're right, paralleling uh, Hercule yep. Poirot wondering if if he causes death wherever yeah, he goes yeah. and stuff like that. So I actually think this movie is more thought through than I, I frankly really even realized even coming out of it. I enjoyed it a lot, but there is this extra layer of of tightness in the script and in the performances and in the plot and the tone and the horror aesthetic. All of this stuff comes together really well. And the final thing that I want to say is that if you're watching this movie and it sounds really cool and we've really only been talking about mostly the mystery mm-hmm. stuff, it's because this movie is let's be real, been frankly, it been misadvertised. Yes. This is not a no, horror no, no, movie. No, no. The trailer is cut together with all the jump scares and all the shadows and all the, you know, what the fuck, a little girl running by in uh-huh. the background and oh, oh, the, in the dripping water that and all that. In the it brings out like a horror crowd, I guess, to yeah. go see this thing. But that's, it's the aesthetic yeah. of a horror movie and there are some definitely more tense sequences than you would usually see Mm -hmm. in this kind of movie because they are in a creaky old castle that has stories of dead children. But most of the movie is Hector Poro doing interrogations and, and, and talking to people and them saying, Oh, I can't believe you fucking thought that I did this. That is, it it really is very similar to the other movies in that regard. I think that it it is different enough to where it sets itself apart from the other things. But if you're going in expecting a horror movie, don't. And if you're, if you're not going it because, Going to it because you think it's a horror movie? Go yeah. see it because it's not really a horror uh, movie. Yeah, I mean it was creative at the very at the very least on the yes, part true. of the the twentieth century studios marketing team. Mm-hmm. So g- yeah, good definitely. on them. But Tucker, yeah. I'm gonna flip it on you. What would you give uh, a haunting in Venice? This might be one of the first times you've ever asked I, me for I a know. score first. That's pretty fucking yeah. crazy. I don't, I, I don't know what to do here. You say a number? Probably try it. Tanner, I'm going to give this movie a 7.9 out of 10. Okay. I think it's great. I think it's great performances. I think it's great. Sim- per- frankly, maybe even some of the best cinematography I've seen yeah. this year. Which is which certainly is the most creative. Say. As as you pointed um, out, I, which I thought was very funny, uh, you, when we were talking about it after we walked out of the theater, you're like, or, or, or Kenneth Branagh, excuse me. <laughs> Kenneth Branagh will like, let's put the camera, uh, let's put the camera up there. And then you like point it to your shoe and you're like, and eh, let's put the camera down there for one shot. Uh, yeah, it is, yeah. It, he just like does whatever he wants with the camera. And it's really, really refreshing. Yeah. Um, your score? Seven and a half. Oh, okay. All right. Any, any closing thoughts there before we end this? Um, it might be the last one. I kind of hope it isn't, uh, because I mm-hmm. uh, this one has renewed my faith in Kenneth Branagh making Absolutely. these films. But it also, you know, it ties together the trilogy. It leaves us on a note of, and Hercule Poirot solves mysteries for the rest of his days, um, yeah. which is vi- the perfect ending and the perfect continuation for more in the series. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. But we will see, and we will be back, of course, to review the other ones. I'm a little bit disappointed we didn't review uh, Death of the Nile last year. It would be fun to like be able to go back and reflect. But I don't get honest. The honest God truth is I don't no. get fun. That movie did not matter much to me, but this one did. And it surprised me, and it, and it brought me back a little bit of faith in modern uh, filmmaking. From Disney. And, uh, don't forget, this is from yeah. Disney. Uh, but if you enjoyed this movie... Uh, please leave a comment telling us what you thought about our review, about our discussion here, and we will see you guys in reviews in the future. Lips Beat. back on the downbeat. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm famous for. That's what people come to the chair like, yo, that's the guy that does lips smack that's on the downbeat? That's fucking Tucker lip smack on the downbeat Hazel. Yo! Na, 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 na. Oh, shit, he's doing a lip smack on the downbeat. That must be Tucker lip smack on the downbeat Hazel. Yo! Yo! Crowds of women and slash or men yeah, and slash faint or. at at the mere sight uh-huh. of Tucker lip smack on the downbeat Hazel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Remember that scene from Elvis? That's literally you. It's basically, saying, yeah. Except yeah. except we're not singing fucking Hayride or whatever. We're it's just you going na 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 na. You know, Tanner, it sounds like you need, you could learn a little something from the I could learn a little something. I, I could learn a little something, I think. I think so. As I live and breathe, is that Hercule Poirot? Now, I do recall you working on a certain haunting in Venice. Is that true? <laughs>